you have your Bibles with you, I encourage you to turn to Hebrews chapter 4. If you're using the Pew Bibles, you'll find that on page 1855. This morning, as we continue our series of messages for the summer title, Finding Our Rest in Jesus, we have this revelation in Hebrews that, that it was always God's plan and promise for us to find our rest in Him. Indeed, He built rest for His people right into His creation. And yet, as we just heard Wayne read, His people didn't always accept His offer of rest, His plan of rest. And one could argue even today, many of God's people don't make resting in Him an intentional part of their spiritual journey. And yet if we dig into God's word, we actually find that God's encouragement for us to rest in him is woven throughout scripture from Genesis to Revelation, which is what the, the author of Hebrews is reminding us of in today's passage, which we'll take a few moments to unpack this morning. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father God, as we enter into your holy scriptures, Lord, to understand your will, to understand your plan and your purpose for us, Lord, we pray that you would give us open hearts and open minds to receive what you have to speak to us this day. Lord, that we would obediently follow your leading. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. So we begin by reading verses 1, and 1 to 3, which says, God's promise of entering his rest still stands. So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. For this good news, that God has prepared this rest, has been announced to us just as it was to them. But it did them no good because they didn't share the faith of those who listened to God. For only we who believe can enter his rest. As for the others, God said, in my anger I took an oath. They will never enter my place of rest. Even though this rest has been ready since he made the world. The good news for we who believe is that God's promise of rest for his people still stands today. And this is a good argument for us that, you know, for those who say, oh, well, that's, you know, that's, that was back in biblical times. That was back in Jesus' day. That was back in David's time. That was back at the beginning of the creation of the world. And, and what does that mean? What does that have to say to us today? It doesn't apply to us today. We're different Oh, are we? We're different than what the author of Hebrews was writing about. Well, maybe not so much. So it's good news for us as we receive this word today that his promise of rest still stands. And clearly the writer of Hebrews was encouraging and warning the hearers of his day and ours that God's promises are sure and true from everlasting to everlasting. There's no time date on these passages. There's no expiration date. They last from, from everlasting to everlasting. But we need to be aware of those around us who may not be living fully into his promises. And to help them. So just to be clear, rest is not a bad thing. Laziness may not be particularly healthy, but rest is not a bad thing. Procrastination may not be a a helpful habit to have, but rest is not a bad thing. Indeed, It is a precious gift from God that he prepared from the beginning 
of creation. And his plan for us from the very beginning was that we would enjoy rest in him. And so by taking time away to spend with him is not a waste of time. Nor is it something that we ought to be ashamed of or refuse to do. For it's part of his created order. Resting is. Indeed, he built rest into every aspect of creation. Although farming practices have changed over the years, leaving fields to, fa to fallow or rest and rejuvenate was a common practice in the past before we got all these wonderful chemicals that we can spray on the soil to cause things to grow. Farmers would leave quadrants of their land, parcels of their land, to rest for a year so they could rejuvenate and replenish the, the nutrients in the soil. It's called fallow. I don't, I don't know if farmers do that anymore because so much of farming today is, ba is, is productivity-based. You have to maximize every piece of land that you've got to produce the maximum amount of crop that you can so that you can make as much money as you can. And when it all gets harvested, you just plow it, plow it under, throw some fertilizer on it, throw some manure on it, throw some whatever on it, I'm not a farmer, and, and you, you replenish the soil for the next planting season. And we have seasons, which give rest to plants that go dormant for a season before coming to life again, to bear fruit. And even animals, know the importance of resting or hibernating for a season. You think of bears, right? They spend the entire summer months fattening up so they can crawl into a hole somewhere when it gets cold and sleep until it gets warm again. Sounds like a pretty good plan to me, but anyway. Somewhere in Florida would be really good. But it's, that, you know, God built this into every aspect of our creation. Bees, I'm fascinated by honeybees. Even honeybees. It's fascinating to, to, to study this, this method of farming and how honeybees instinctively know when they need to kind of huddle in and, and protect each other for the winter and they, they have a system of, of rotating in and out of the, 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 the clump of bees. I know that's a, probably not the technical term the beekeepers use, but, it, you know, and they, they rotate in and out so that the, the ones on the inside will be warm and then they kind of work their way out until, so that the ones on the outside can move in and get warm. And, and it, it's, it's all part of God's created order. And, and people will say to you, well, no, that's not God. That's just the way bees are. Okay. So who programmed the first bee to know how to be? Right? God did. God did. It's all part of God's plan for creation. And somehow the most intelligent creatures in God's creation, that would be all of us, don't seem to get it. We, don't, we refuse to recognize the importance of this plan of God's promise of rest for his creation. And when I went through seminary back in the, in the early 2000s, there was, a, there was a real emphasis in seminary about honoring the Sabbath and, and self-care. Because what they had recognized by the time I got through seminary, but what they had recognized was there was a whole, whole boatload of pastors who never really understood what rest meant. 
and they were burning out. And when they burned out, they were useless to God and to the congregations they were serving. And burnout was a huge problem. And so the seminaries were saying, we've got to fix this. We've got to figure out a way, a way to fix this. And somebody said, well, I think the Bible has something to say about that. It's called Sabbath. Right? God, God actually told us this was his plan for us. Oh, yeah. And so they started teaching it. And so I, I was kind of in the, in the, the early stages of that that new kind of understanding of what it meant to be a pastor. And it was hard for congregations because they weren't accustomed to that. They were accustomed to their pastors working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They were on call all the time, every day, every, no matter what. I knew pastors who went on vacation and they were still working when they were on vacation, answering the phone, dealing with issues back at the church. Newsflash, that's not a vacation. You're just working remotely. And most people who have, who have worked in their lives will know that it's not acceptable when you're on holidays for your boss to be calling you on the phone and saying, hey, I need you to deal with this right now. Can you, can you stop what you're doing and, and you know, log into your computer or pick up the phone and fix this? No, I'm on holidays. Well, we need you to do this right now. That, that wouldn't fly with most people. And, and yet, it was a real problem in the church. And so this, this, this new emphasis on, on being biblically minded and, and modeling the example of what Scripture encourages us to do as pastors was important. It, this, this notion of, of resting in Jesus is actually a spiritual discipline. It's, it's actually something that we have to teach ourselves or we have to ask God to teach us how to do. Because in as much as Jim confessed that he's a control freak, um, you may have noticed that I have some OCD tendencies too, right? And, and, and I, as I, I confessed with the board, I, like, I can work on church stuff all day, every day. And it's, and it's very easy now because we now have smartphones, which are basically handheld computers, Everything that I can do on my, pretty much everything that I can do on my laptop, I can do on my smartphone, right? I can answer emails, I can send texts, I can answer phone calls, I can write my sermon, I can take notes, I can write grocery lists. I mean, like, the ability for us to disconnect and shut down is even more difficult today than it ever was. And so God's plan for rest for us is even more important. And it's a spiritual discipline. It's something that we have to actually discipline ourselves to do. Because it's God's plan for us. It's his, his will for us to be more intentional, intentional, intentional about taking Sabbath every week. And so I'm doing that. I have told the board, and I've told my, I've shared this with the ministerial so they can help keep me accountable. When I leave the church on Sunday afternoon, the door is locked, and Susan and I go home, my Sabbath begins. And my Sabbath goes from then through to the end of the day, Monday. That's my Sabbath. And that's time for me to spend with Susan and with God. And that's my time of rest. 
And, and I needed to do, do this intentionally because I knew, I know myself. And I know that if I'm not intentional about this, if I don't have the board helping me with this, if I don't have my, the ministerial keeping me accountable to it, it's very easy for me to, to not do that. And that's not healthy for me and it's not helpful for you. And that's, and that's not my day off. My day off is actually Saturday and Monday. Saturday is not... <laughs> so newsflash to pastors, we don't get two days off a week. We get one day off a week and if we're lucky, two. Um, and that's just the nature of being a pastor. So Saturday is my, my other unofficial day off. Um, and when it is possible for me to do so, I take that off as well. Um, and you will have noticed in the bullets in the last few weeks that um, that little section talking about the office hours has changed. So that you are aware that my day off is Monday and Saturday. And if you need anything, you contact Roz. She has stepped up and said, I will be that contact person for you when you are on, on, on holidays and on your days off. And if there's an emergency, she can contact the board. And the board can figure out what to do. But it's... For it, it, it was important for me to do this because I need to model this for you. I can't tell you all to be taking, the time, taking rest, taking Sabbath, you know, making time away to take away with God if I'm not doing it myself. That's what the Pharisees did when Jesus called them hypocrites. And so I'm being intentional about that for my own health, but also for, so that I can be a better pastor for you. And because there are consequences if we don't make it an intentional spiritual discipline. And we see that in verses 3 to 6. We read, for, though, for only we who believe can enter the, his rest. As for the others, God said, in my anger I took an oath. They will never enter my place of rest. Even though this rest has been ready since he made the world. We know it is, it is ready because of the place in the scriptures where it mentions the seventh day. On the seventh day, God rested from all his work. But in the other passage, God said, they will never enter my place of rest. So God's rest is there for people to enter, but those who first heard this good news failed to enter because they disobeyed God. So there are consequences. There are consequences. And, and the author of Hebrews is quoting Genesis, and, and we're going to get to that passage actually in a couple of weeks when Tom's, um, when Tom's preaching. I think it's when Tom's preaching when I'm off on holidays. Yeah, it's, yes, it is when Tom's preaching um, and, and I'm on holidays. So that, 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 that passage from Genesis, from the creation story in Genesis, is where God rested on the seventh day is kind of the foundation of this Sabbath rest that he has prepared for us. It's, it's paramount for us to, to live our lives of faith, obedient to his will, to his promises. And as we spoke a couple of weeks ago, the consequences, our physical human consequences of not being intentional about receiving God's offer of rest is burnout and exhaustion, and weariness, and being heavy laden. And the reality is God labored six days, and then on the seventh day, he rested. 
And he gave this as a gift to us to do the same, resting in him. But there's good news, friends. There's good news. The author of Hebrews doesn't leave us in this, in this, this place of, of fear and of the consequences of not obeying his will. We read in verses 7 to 10. So God set another time for entering his rest. And that time is today. God announced this through David much later in the words already quoted. Today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Now, if Joshua had, successful, had succeeded in giving them his rest, God would not have spoken about another day of rest to come. So there is a special rest still waiting for the people of God. For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors, just as God did after creating the world. So you see, even, even if you haven't been very good, very intentional about entering into a time of rest with God, he's given you today to start. This is day one, friends. God has given us this day to say, I am going to do something new. I am going to begin a new spiritual discipline in my life. I am going to live according to God's will, and I am going to rest. Because he's given us this opportunity to start today. And there's no, lot, there's no time like the present to start a new spiritual discipline, entering into God's rest is to receive his blessing as a result. And, and I want to be clear. I, I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not suggesting a program or something structured necessarily, although if that works for you, then great. But God delights when we just come to him. And he rejoices when we shut down and rest in him. Because he truly loves us and wants what's best for us and from us. And there's no perfect way to do this. And, and just so you know, there's no exam. There's no follow-up. There's no schedule. This is between you and God. And what works for one person won't necessarily work for another. But if you seek the Lord's help, he will show you the way. He will show you what works for you because he knows you better than you know you. And it was and is part of his plan and promise for each one of his, us, his beloved children. And so finally we read in verse 11. So let us do our best to enter that rest. But if we disobey God, as the people of Israel did, we will fall. We're encouraged to do our best, friends, to be intentional, to take seriously God's will, his plan and promise of rest for his people. We don't need to be perfect. We just need to do our best and let God help us because he, he, he will help us when we seek him with our whole heart, when we ask him to help us. And he will also let us know when we haven't been faithful in honoring his promise of rest. And the author of Hebrews warns us of this. He says, if we disobey God as the people of Israel did, we will fall. What does falling look like? Well, could be burnout. Could be a heart attack. I, I remember a, a pastor colleague of mine when I was out west, same age as me. Actually, we were kind of spitting images. We were grossly overweight. We were working, burning the candle at both ends, trying to build the church. And he had a heart attack. And that heart attack stopped him in his tracks. 
It didn't kill him. It didn't kill him. But God said, you need to stop. And you're not listening to me, so I'm stopping you. And I'm going to force you into a season of rest. And for, I can't remember whether it was six or eight months or a year, he did nothing but re recover and spend time with God. And God made it clear to him that he had another plan for him and it wasn't to go back to the church. God also used that for me. <laughs> Thankfully, I didn't have a heart attack. But I recognized that it could very easily have been me. That could have been my story. And so I took heed to his warning because I did not want to fall. I did not want to be stopped in my tracks. I certainly didn't want to repeat the pattern that my dad did, went through. Heart attack, triple bypass surgery, and on and on. And so I said, okay, God, I get it. <laughs> I hear you. And I started the process of changing my life with his help to be more healthy spiritually, physically, emotionally, and, and absolutely as a pastor. It may, be, it may come as a, to some as, as an illness or a, an ailment that sidelines you for a while. Maybe it's just walking away from God altogether, abandoning your faith in Jesus. I, friends, I have witnessed all of those things happen with people that I've known or known of. And, and the common thread through all of those is they didn't take a Sabbath. They didn't take time away to rest and rejuvenate in Jesus. And friends, the truth is, and spoiler alert, but we are not the Energizer Bunny. We do not just keep going and going and going and going and going. And as much as we may want to think we are, as much as we may want to think that we're invincible, as much as we want to think that, that by resting shows weakness or by resting shows somehow we are less than others, it's not true. We need rest. True rest in Jesus. Rest for our weary souls. Rest from our labors. Rest to just be in his presence. To be still. I love that song, Fim, that you shared earlier. And I know you've shared that before, but I, I, I'm with you with that. It's a beautiful song. The message is just to be still in his presence. And know that he is God. And his plan and promise for us was and is rest. And God taught this by example. Right? He taught this by example. Seventh day he rested. Jesus, throughout the Gospels, there's all kinds of examples in the Gospels where Jesus set the example for us by taking time away to rest. Sometimes on his own, sometimes with his disciples. And if we're going to lead others to follow Jesus, we have to do likewise. We have to, to teach and model the importance of resting in Jesus as a part of our spiritual journey. It's been said, sleep and rest is highly overrated and a waste of time. Anybody heard that? 
Anybody believe it? Um, yeah, it's a lie. It's a lie. The truth is, though, a lot of people have bought into that lie. And we need to teach by our example the truth of God's word and his promise for his people, which is the importance of resting in him. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you that your promises are sure and true, that you are faithful to keeping your promises even when we may not be particularly faithful in following according to your will. Lord, help us to be the best that we can at resting in you so that we may set the example for others to find their rest in you also. Lord, we commit ourselves to your care and your keeping. And we pray, O oh God, that in the power of your Holy Spirit, you will help us to be all that you have called us to be, but that we would also just be. Be still in your presence, to know that you are God, and to hear your still, small voice speaking to us. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.